I'll share our screen here. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Tonight we are looking at the book called Song of Songs. And um, just a couple of some facts about Song of Songs, okay? In some translations, it's called Song of Solomon, right? Um, but if you're actually looking at the book, the verse ones, or no, I think the very first thing it says is this is Solomon's Song of Songs. So that's where that title comes from. Although, um, and so Solomon is given credit for writing the book, but again, it could be one of those things where it's a part of his archives. It could have been a collection that he gathered together rather than his own writing. If he did write it, it's likely that he wrote it early um, in his kingship because um, he contradicts some of it with his life later on. And so, um, so it's assumed that that if it is written by him, it was written early on. Um, this is actually a collection of poems, and they believe that these are actually a part of Hebrew tradition um, songs. They're not poems, songs that were actually um, recited at weddings. That would make sense. Yes, and at weddings, um, very often the groom would be called the king, and the bride would be called the queen so that's again why they're not sure even though there's a couple of king references in here they're not sure if that's actually referring to Solomon or if it's about um, the bridegroom and whoever that might have been so if because we assume that it came from Solomon or his um, archives then it's from the kingdom era okay because we read about Solomon in first kings it's um, from the genre of poetry. This is actually our last poetry book. Anybody remember what the others were? Psalms. Psalms was one. Yeah. Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Two more. Is Proverbs yes. poetry? Proverbs. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. One more. Oh, Ecclesiastes. No, we said no. Ecclesiastes. Oh, we said that. <laughs> the first one. Is that That's the first one? Hmm? Is it no. Job. 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 Yes. Job. That's right. Job. Uh, that was a poem. I keep forgetting. Yes. Uh, Job is a. Uh, Job does, covers Job. many genres, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does. It does. So, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs are the five books of poetry um, that are from Hebrew tradition. Song of Songs is kind of smack dab in the middle of the Old Testament, it's the 22nd book. And it has eight chapters in it. Um, and so I thought before we started that, though, I would share something else with you. And this, I want to see if this is familiar. If maybe you know about this famous couple who lived in England um, almost 200 years ago. Um, and they were famous for their poetry, uh, their poetry and their love sonnets to one another. This is Robert and Emily Barrett Browning. Have oh, y'all yeah. heard of them before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so here's the cool thing. Robert Browning actually wrote to Elizabeth Barrett because she was famous for her writings, and he was a writer as well. So he was kind of like a fan, and so he wrote to her, and um, they started corresponding to each other and a love relationship developed out of that. She was actually an invalid. She had gotten some kind of lung disorder and was, um, and I think about the age of 13, she never grew past that. Like her physically, her body stopped growing um, once she got that disease and she was frail and her father was very overprotective of her. In fact, he didn't want any of his daughters to marry, um, but both were from pretty devout Christian families. They ended up eloping and um, and they moved to Italy where she got better because of her lung condition um, which doctors had said might get better if she moved from England to Italy but her dad didn't want to move so anyway kind of an interesting story but they're famous for this love story that happened between them even though they only had 15 years together before she passed away 
um, they did have one son together. So one of their most, one of her most common or most popular sonnets is this uh, 43rd sonnet. And it's from a book called um, Songs of the Portuguese. Portuguese was said to be, a, his nickname for her was close to that. Hmm. Um, and, and one of the beliefs is that they were writing about their personal relationship, but they didn't want to put it out there for everybody. Mm -hmm. So they put it in a publication that looked like it could have been someone else's work. Mm -hmm. So you won't find their names in it. That's and that cool. kind of, so interesting stuff. So let me just read this to you. She wrote, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. When feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I love, thee, I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God chooses, I shall but love thee better after death. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? It's beautiful. Yeah. I think that um, the reason that I wanted to start with that is because this is kind of an example of the kind of songs that you see in Song of Songs. And so while for us it seems strange, and why is it? But when you see it in the context of their relationship, that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? But when, so if you were to take it out of there, you might not understand it. And mm -hmm. so Song of Songs is the same way that when we see it in the context of the relationship of this couple that's writing, then we learn something new about it. And so let me stop, stop my sharing right there. We'll come back to that theme verse later on. So... So when we look at Song of Songs and it seems really odd, try to remember that it's a love that it's a love song written to um, to one another. Okay, I wonder though if that kind of poetry is kind of a lost art, don't you think? I think it probably is. I like it. But I'm not aware of any modern day uh, poets. No. Um, not that there aren't any that write like that. I'm sure that there are, but maybe they're just not celebrated or popular in our culture anymore. And so as you know, that even had the the, the nows and that kind of thing, and it sounds a little foreign to our language, and in the same way Song of Songs does. Um, but there are things in there that can apply to any age, mm -hmm. I think. So so that takes us to Song of Songs. I don't have illustrations for all these, sorry. <laughs> so we'll do this without PowerPoint. Um, when you go through Song of Songs, you find that it's songs that are written to each other from a female and a male perspective, okay? So there's like this back and forth that's going on between them. And um, one of the cool things about Song of Songs is then that much of it is accredited to a female writer. You don't find that in the Bible very often, right? Um, matter of fact, there's not a single book in the Bible that anybody would de definitively say was written by a female. So, um, so here we get to hear from her perspective as much or more as we do from his. And it describes an intimate, passionate relationship between a couple. It's idealized in some ways, which would make sense if it's something that would, would have been sung at weddings. That's a time for where things are really idealized, right? And, uh, but it's a love story that presents truth with the human experience of love. And so I think that's what we'll see in it, that there's truth inside of it. I have a quote about it, um, and I didn't write down where the quote's from, and so we'll have to accredit it to unknown, but it's not me, okay? But here's what it said. Sexual imagery is powerful. Our culture abounds with images and paradigms that corrupt more than they instruct and wound more than they heal. So much of the culture's presentation of sexuality is crass, lacking the beauty and mystery that should characterize the physical consummation and enduring love of marriage. A study of the Song of Songs can revise our understanding and help us reclaim in holiness 
the sexual expression that God has created and declared good. I, I like that quote because I think it addresses our culture where we have really taken intimacy outside of the context of what God intended. And it reminds us then that if we go back to scripture and read it, that we see that this is something beautiful that God created, right? Exactly, because marriage is something beautiful that God created. You know, when a man leaves his, you know, mother and father, he cleaves to his wife. And within that scope, it is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, though, like it's you said, it, yeah, mm -hmm. our culture has just turned it all into something that it's not. Yeah. So, or shouldn't be. I agree. Yeah. And, so, and really, so that was God's design, mm -hmm. wasn't it? For a male and a female to become one. And right. that's a physical and a spiritual and an emotional uniting of one another. And that's where right. that was designed. So um, the question is out there then, is Song of Songs about a married couple or not? Because it doesn't flat out say right. that, right? Mm -hmm. And it, this is this more than most books I read. Reading the different translations is really interesting mm -hmm. um, because you see the, just the choice of words can be so different from one translation to the next. Um, but you do see the word bride several times, okay? So um, so the, I think that what this is is a couple that is betrothed to one another, and then at the end of the book, you see where they are married. And so throughout, they're celebrating their union that way. But in 4, verse 8, and 5, verse 1, he calls her his bride. Um, and even at the end of chapter 1, she makes reference to our home. And our home in those days would have been the home of a married couple. So I think that's really important for us to have as our perspective, that this is a book about marriage and about the love that happens within it. Um, and then, like you were saying, Susan, God created this aspect of people, and so it's important for us to have a healthy understanding of it. Um, and I, I wonder sometimes if the church doesn't talk about these things enough. And so when you don't talk about something that's a real experience, people fill in the gaps on their own, don't they? Yeah. And so, so human desire is normal, and it's part of who we are. And if we don't talk about it, then the culture is more than happy to talk about it. Could it be because... Um you know, even within our churches, we have a variety of different um, uh, levels of people. Like we have single women, single men, you know, uh, men who are widowers, you know, just so many so it different. Seems like it doesn't yeah, apply to everyone. doesn't apply to everyone. Yeah. So, you know, we don't want to, you know, make anybody feel out of place because this doesn't apply to them. Yeah. So maybe that's one of the reasons why it's not addressed more within the church. That makes sense. I think too, because it's private. Yeah. It's a private matter, it isn't is. it? You know, yeah. so it's kind of awkward to talk about mm -hmm. private things, but yeah. Well, you know, yeah. marriage should apply to everyone, not just the married couples. It should be also single people because they may not always be single. Yeah. And they need to know Yeah. what it's, uh, they need to know the rules of marriage or mm -hmm. what they a need healthy to, marriage looks like. Yeah, yeah. they need to know yeah. what a healthy, healthy marriage looks like. And and watching sure. well I'm not gonna say um watching the couples in this church is, is yeah. not a bad thing. Right. But right. sometimes when you're looking at couples, like sometimes when kids are looking at their parents and their parents are divorced and maybe married three or four times. And yeah. I mean my parents were married for fifty something years. Yeah. But they don't, uh, kids don't always have, or single people don't mm -hmm. always have that example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe if we talked about it more, it would benefit a lot of people. I think so. I agree. I agree. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. All right. So, um, so what we're going to look at then are some of the themes that we find in Song of Songs, okay? Um, and we're not going to go over these in detail, but... But what you'll find is that there's a mutual attraction between the man and the woman. There is some longing and chasing after the beloved. There are some insecurities expressed. And I love that because even in chapter one, I think it's either one or two. And the woman's like, don't look at my dark skin. I had to work in the field. Yeah. And, uh, and I can remember my grandmother saying that, that mm -hmm. they used to work in the fields with gloves on because um, only the poor kids had to work the farm. Mm -hmm. And so if they had a tan, it meant that they were poor. 
And what she's saying is, don't, you know, I hope you don't mind my dark skin. It's because I had to work in the vineyards. Mm -hmm. And so she's insecure. And then there's another part where she's going after him and looking for him. Like, um, you know, she's, she's lost him. And that makes her feel insecure as well. Um, what you also see, though, is a praise of one another and a rejoicing when they come back together. And also this sense of belonging to one another. So in chapter 2, verse 16, she says, my beloved is mine and I am his. Mm -hmm. And he browses among the lilies. And then it goes on to say, but he returns to me. Um, and he says in 4, 9, you have captured my heart, my treasure, my bride. You hold it hostage with one glance of your eyes and a single jewel of your necklace. So you see this mutually attract, this mutual attraction there and a sense that they belong to one another. And that's one of the things that you get in the context of marriage that you don't get outside of that context, right? That there is this marriage is a lifelong covenant relationship. And inside of that, there's a lot of security, right? Because if you know that somebody is going to be there forever and ever, and, and that they're a part of you, then you feel a lot more free to be yourself because of that sense of belonging, right? And I think that was part of God's intent. So different from the lust-driven culture of our world today, mm -hmm. because in our world today, people still have these same kind of longings that they had then, but today they're expressed outside of that covenant relationship and outside of that belonging and so that's what makes them destructive um, and so um, so in addition to that then you see warnings within this book okay so we're gonna um, let's let's do some reading here of the warnings um, Dola can you read from chapter 2 verse 7 promise me a women of Jerusalem by the gazelles and wild deer, not to awaken love until the time is right. Okay. Um, and three verse five says exactly the same thing. And Susan, do you have eight verse four? Sure. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Okay. So I like the way the NLT puts it and says until the time is right, is right until mm -hmm. it's the right time yeah um and so so you see how when something is said three times in, a, in just eight chapters that means it really matters mm -hmm. right and so mm -hmm. so in the midst of all this the man talking to the woman and the woman talking to the man <laughs> then you see her turn to her friends and say promise me that you won't awaken these desires until the time is right mm -hmm. and so um and so i think that's that's an important part of this chapter or this book, right? Is to say, look at the passion that's expressed within this couple. But if you're not in that place, don't awaken those desires inside of you. And that is a lost instruction today, isn't it? Mm. And yet we see it over and over again. And I think, um, I think it's an important lesson to be passed on among God's people. And, uh, if our, if our desires are awakened too soon, it takes people away from the love that God intended them to know and into cheap substitutes mm -hmm. instead, doesn't it? And, and that's, that's one of those things that as adults, we all know that once that, once that has been awoke, awakened, there's no putting it back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And so for, for our teenagers, you know, that's a lesson that we need to teach, to teach. Don't start it because once you do, it's very hard to close Pandora's box. Mm -hmm. And um, and the problem is, once you once you miss out on God's plan, you'll never know it the same way it was intended to be. Mm -hmm. You know, so even if you come to Christ after that and come back and do things the right way, you still have missed out on the innocence and discovery that God meant for you to have only within that context. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's true. Yeah. You can't get it back, right? And and there is detriment that comes from that. Even in couples that go on to get married later on, they miss something that they would have had if they had done it in a God-honoring way because God had this thing for them. 
and and they settled for something cheaper. And so, so it's an important lesson to look to learn that we get from the verses of Song of Songs. Another um, aspect of this book that you may have noticed if you've read it is that it's highly allegorical, right? This is a form of poetry. And so there's a lot of symbolism in there. Um, That's what I was going to bring up. I'm glad you did. Yeah. Some of it's really funny, isn't it? Yeah. So, so when you're looking at an allegory, what you want to do is find the quality that's the same. So, um, because some of them are kind of silly. And so that's, so like when it says king, it may not be King Solomon. It might be the bridegroom, right? Um, but when it says that your neck is like an ivory tower, that sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? And, um, which I guess ivory tower is better than a bag of flour. I don't know. You know? <laughs> so, so, so you just have to look for that. So we're going to, let's pick out a few of those. Also, what you'll notice is that there's a lot of garden imagery, which takes you back to the Garden of Eden and that first relationship and how things were intended. You're still laughing at that way. <laughs> so, um, um, but also, um, they were living in a desert land, right? And so there was a lot of dryness. And, and if you think about how the garden would have felt in that environment, that it would have been so um, lush and welcoming and, um, and sustaining and all of those things. So that's important. Who wants to read um, 2 verse 2? Greg, you got that one? Yeah. <clears throat> Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. Thank you. So, so there a lily among thorns is the, um, the allegory, right? And before that, if you go back to verse one, she's just said, I'm nothing but a, a, a lily. You know, she's saying, I'm just a common flower among many. And he's saying, no, you're like one lily among all the thorns. So that's kind of a powerful picture, isn't it? All right, who wants to re read the next verse? Like an three. apple tree among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. All right. So if you if you're have you ever been in a forest? There's not any apple trees no. in the forest. Where do <laughs> apple trees grow in the orchard, right? Right, right. So in the same way that she's rare. And, you know, she's a lily among this field of thorns, and he's an apple tree among all these cedars, yeah, right? Apple tree. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody want to sit under a cedar tree for shade? No, those like the little things fall in your yeah. hair, and it's not good shade, exactly. right? They go all the way down, yes. But an apple tree has good shade, right? Mm -hmm. And it's strong, and it's also fruitful. Right. And so there's a lot of there's something life giving about an apple tree that's different than a cedar tree. All right. Can I can I say one more thing about that verse? As long as it's not about Greg. It's it's about and I don't know where else it says it or if it's just a saying, you know, that we are the apple of his eye like God sees us as the apple of his eye. So I, I think that's just another aspect of the allegory that comes in here where we can also take it to another extreme saying, you know, that's how God sees us. Yeah, very good. Very good. Real good, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, can I get a lady to read five verses 10 through 16? Uh, got it? Okay. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 2,000. His head is the finest gold, his locks are wavy, black as raven. His eyes are like doves beside streams of water, bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. Keep on through 16. I'm sorry. His arms are rods of gold set with jewels. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns set on bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as cedars. 
His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So none of those descriptions really sound that attractive, do they? <laughs> Your eyes are like doves. What does that mean? <laughs> by the flowing, by the water flowing with milk or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and arms like gold something, you know, like, yeah. like gold doesn't bend or, you know. <laughs> but it's shiny. <laughs> yeah. But I like at the end how she called him her friend. Yeah. Too. And um, I think that says more than uh, some of the other descriptions. Yeah. All right, can I get a guy to read six verses four through seven? You got it, Tyson? Yeah, I do. Okay. Do you want to hear King James? We would love to hear okay. King James. Thou art beautiful, oh my love, as, okay, can someone tell me how to say Okay, as Terza, come, come we as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Turn away thine eyes from me, for the, they have overcome me. Their hair is as a flock of goats <laughs> that <not> appear <laughs> from Gilead. Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep. <laughs> Go up from the washing, whereof everyone beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. Am I supposed to I think one more. Okay. As a piece of pomegranate are the or thy temple within thy locks. <laughs> okay. Um, that Are was kind of funny, wasn't it? Your, <laughs> your hair falls in waves like a flock of goats. <laughs> <laughs> and it's your teeth that are white as sheep yeah. that are freshly washed. Yeah. Only sheep that have just been washed. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and it says each tooth is matched with its twin. I you know, know. so that's, I think you said not one is missing, you know. So. <laughs> You have all your teeth, you're so beautiful. <laughs> uh, I from myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible, Tyson. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's an example of allegories, right? That, that you are like this or your eyes are like this. And, and we see that throughout these songs. And uh, I'm sure today we would have much different descriptions. Mm -hmm. But how cool to think that they have studied each other mm -hmm. and, um, and are coming up with ways to describe it. All right. Another aspect that I want to draw on from this book, though, is kind of what Dole was saying earlier about how marriage is, everybody should be concerned about marriage. Because you see the friends who are brought into this book as well. So a lot of times it'll be him, and then it'll be her, and it'll be friends and then back to her and him. And so, so the friends actually have a voice in what's going on throughout these songs, okay? So if we look at, um, and that starts in the first chapter in verse four, the latter half of that verse says, how happy we are for you, O King. We praise your love even more than wine. And then if you go to the second half of verse one in chapter five, it says, this is the friends again. O oh, lover and beloved, eat and drink. Yes, drink deeply of your love. And so you see their friends coming around them to celebrate this union that's taking place and their love for each other. And, um, and so there's something honorable about that, right? Their love doesn't, this kind of love doesn't happen in isolation. It happens in community. And it is something that people should see, I think. Dole's already, you already preached that, you know, <laughs> you, you already taught that part of the lesson, and, but I think that's so important, because in the church, when we talk about marriage and, um, and relationships that way, that's part of why you need the church, because mm -hmm. relationships aren't always easy, but you need champions around you who will say, you need to love each other, and y'all need to work on things, and and we believe in your love and 
and, you know, to be our cheerleaders, right? And that's who we ought to be as cheerleaders for one another. And also the friends who say, don't awaken the desire before it's time. Mm -hmm. so, so you find that in the context of God's family where we can speak into one another's lives and love. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times you see a couple that, if you see a couple that's dating and everybody's against it, you're like, well, they don't know what they're talking about, you know. But a lot of times it's because people see something that maybe the you don't see. Once those desires, I don't know, y'all remember, once those desires are like kicked off, then your logic ability goes, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. right out the window, right? <laughs> but I love him, you know. <laughs> the, one of the greatest things my mother ever did was talk me into waiting <laughs> to, um, to get married to a guy I dated in college and um and I thought that was great wisdom because um she was like just just wait just don't do it right now and it took about two months and I was like yeah so anyway you need the community of God to come around you and support healthy relationships and hold us accountable um and there's a family-like quality that happens there you also see that influence of family on her from her brothers and mm -hmm. so the first verse the first chapter she's like my brothers made me work the field you know and but at the end in chapter eight there you see the brothers saying they were worrying about her when she was young and um and so this is i thought hilarious because the brothers are saying well, what are we going to do to protect our sister and they said well if she's like a wall we'll build an ivory tower or steel tower around her but if she's like a swinging door, we'll bar the door. <laughs> when one of the translations says promiscuous, right? A swinging door, right? And they're like, if she's like that, we're barring the door, you know. And then she comes back and goes, I'm a wall, I'm a wall, you know. <laughs> I'm not a swinging door, you know. So <laughs> but, but there's this protective quality that you see of the brothers that are saying that, that she is a treasure that needs to be protected so that she's ready at the right time. And so I think that's a beautiful picture as well. And that's part of the role of the church and part of our roles as aunts and grandparents and parents that, that we have this protective thing about the people in our lives to say, don't go down that road. Do it God's way so that you can experience the fullness of God's blessings. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and the apples that fall from the tree. <laughs> yeah. that really, marriage should be considered sacred by the people of God. It is sacred. It was created by God, and it's a gift from God, and it doesn't happen accidentally. It has to be protected and fought for, and, um, and I think that you just don't see that anymore. You see a total disregard for marriage, and um, you know, when I was growing up, sometimes people had children outside of wedlock, um, and it wasn't, the, it was kind of shameful. I, I'm looking for the right words. That was considered shameful, yeah. not that the child was, but no. that what happened was um, the culture, the generations that are coming up today don't have that understanding at all. It, it doesn't make sense to them that you would get married. <clears throat> yeah and and so that's because maybe we haven't done a good job at protecting the sacredness of marriage and and that that sacredness is forsaken anytime people awaken the desires too early because you can't do as i do as i say not as i not as i do right? that doesn't work very well and so uh, it's an unfortunate turn of events so God's not mentioned in the book of Song of Songs. Did you hear him anywhere? Mm -hmm. No. So why do you think this is included in the Bible? Then? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think part of my thought process before with the allegorical aspect, you know, of God with his people, you know, his chosen people that it's 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 that type of relationship not sexual but the love you know for each other should be there like our relationship with god though not a sexual one should be that one where he is our everything 
and we want him to be our, you know, our everything. It's it's the oneness that yeah. you see, yeah. that belonging right. and the oneness, and you see that through Christ especially, right? Um, Ephesians five thirty one says, uh, um, the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Right. So, so very good. But it's not talking about the um, the physical attraction right. or the sexual attraction. It's talking about the oneness that comes about because of that. And so really what you see in Song of Songs is an expression of their oneness, right? Yes. And they're enjoying parts about each other that should only be shared in the context of oneness. And so, so all of that, that which is described is, is a description of their intimacy and their, their intimate knowledge of one another. You know, to know someone so well to say, each one of your teeth has a twin. Not a single one is missing. You know, that's really intimate knowledge, isn't it? Um, and there's some other things that we skipped right over that are even a little more intimate, you know, um, from a knowledge perspective. But So like you said, it's not a sexual thing, but it is a great allegory of a relationship that's one. Um, I think that interpretation which used to be more popular than it is now. I think early scholars believed that that Song of Songs was representative of God and his people. And I think we especially see that with Christ and the church um, as well. So, okay, and here's the other things. Remember how we said it was part of the genre of poetry? Many people, many scholars also include Song of Songs as part of wisdom literature. So why would this be considered wisdom literature? Because it's giving some instruction to a degree. If it's, it, you know, if, if it was in fact part of the marriage ceremony, you know, to do this type of song, it's instruction to both the groom and the bride. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? <coughs> it's kind of attributed somewhat to Solomon, and he's the wisest man. Um, and he's mentioned in the book several times. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, if he's the wisest person, uh, and this is attributed to him, you, get, you know, included in the wisdom. Mm -hmm. and maybe it's a little deeper than, you know. Yeah. I think so. Any other thoughts on that? Well, this, this type of love for someone is, in a way, wisdom. It, it's in a way of, in a way, it's teaching. Um, it's wise to to love someone like this, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And this, I think of this as a teaching tool to teach people. This is the way love should be or the way marriage should be this is what it should be like mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point yeah always building up you should always build your uh, significant other up you know, that's what they're doing to each other yeah the way they praise each other you mm -hmm. know and you know in, in relationships change over time and so you would hope that at the beginning of a marriage there would be more of that fire that's there but it but when that virus tended properly, there are things that last throughout the relationship. So 50 years later, it may not look like it did when they first um, were united, but that same love and passion and praise for one another carries through. And so it may be expressed differently, but it's still a pattern that began early in a relationship and lasts throughout. Um, so I think, I think those were all good answers. And I, I, to me, that it's the same thing we were kind of talking about earlier, too, that when you don't address something that's a very human experience, then people don't know how to handle that correctly. And so what Solomon does is he gives us a picture of what it should be like. You know, interesting, there's one part in there that says, you, you know, I looked at a thousand women, but none of them compared to you. 
Well, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, right? Oh. And so, um, so I don't know if that might be irony or, you know, <laughs> but, but um, this might have been his one true love. It might have been. And maybe, and I think this is the wisdom actually that Solomon lost yeah. because that's when that was his downfall was bringing in all these other women. And, and if he had conducted his relationship this way and stayed true to that, then his legacy may have been a lot more powerful than it was. And maybe his children would have been, you know, successful in leading after him. And who knows what would have happened mm -hmm. if he hadn't have fallen from, from God's plan that way. Maybe this, well, I think, go ahead, Yoba. Maybe this was his first wife. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so 60 queens there may be and 80 concubines. And Virgin, we all know that my, that my, uh, my perfect one is unique. I just have to say that. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think, too, if they're in different cultures and they're different religions, and then, you know, it kind of just gets the confusion in there. You just don't know. Um, okay, well, I like this person this way. Well, I like this one for that. I like this one for that. Well, it's so confusion because they're not um, uh, united in their beliefs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it affects your kids. It affects everything. Yeah. yeah. Don't you think that was why it was one of God's commandments to them was mm -hmm. to not marry people from outside, the, outside the Jewish race? And it wasn't a racial issue as much as it was a, a religious issue, mm -hmm. right? So how can you be one with somebody who doesn't put the same God first? And and so, and that God is, Violet, is that your smoke alarm going off again? Yes. <laughs> and I I had a batter in the door, uh, in the uh, drawer, and I put it in there and it's still chirping. So evidently I had an old batter and I haven't gotten it yet to go get another one. So I'm like, Ugh. but yes, it's chirping again. Um, you reminded me of that video with Phoebe. Anyway, so I think, but I think what you said was, was why Violet though, that, um, then that was part of Solomon's downfall mm -hmm. as well, is that he married women from other, kingdoms and um and when god says put me first he really means it doesn't he <coughs> he means that in every aspect of your life and so if you're putting god first how are you going to be one with somebody who doesn't put god first yeah it doesn't work does it and then and that is wisdom right yeah all right so let me share then our um our verse with you this is from the last chapter and she says place me like a seal over your heart like a seal on your arm for love is as strong as death it's jealousy unyielding as the grave it burns like a blazing fire like a mighty flame and some translations say like a mighty flame of god um, and i i think there's <clears throat> wisdom in that too because the power of love is as strong as the power of death. Mm -hmm. And so then it makes sense that we should get biblical insight into what love should look like because it is powerful. Would you, would you guys agree? Yes. Yeah. Love can make you do crazy things, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and maybe love harnessed the right way can do wonderful things. All right. Any other thoughts? about Song of Songs? Was it less painful than you thought it would be? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> I have to admit, I, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time in that book before, and, well, I hadn't really in Ecclesiastes either. But actually, go through and read it in the message. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's what I really enjoy, because um, the message is more like words we would use. Um, it still uses some of those pastoral allegories, like the sheep and stuff like that, but um, but the wording is more like that we would choose. <clears throat> and um, and I just encourage you know all of us are pretty stable in our lives, but but this is something we should talk about with mm -hmm. young people in our lives. Yeah. And um, and not be hush hush, but to be you know wow have you seen what a beautiful powerful force love is and let's you know let's look at mm -hmm. it together and. Um, when we can't talk about it, remember 
that the culture is talking about it. And that's, um, yeah. and so it's worth feeling awkward over, isn't it? To, um, oh, daughters of Jerusalem, promise me that you will not awaken these desires before the right time. And that, you know, that's a plea worth making to our sons and our daughters. Yes. Yeah. And don't let them be an open gate or swinging gate. That's game. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> either either set. Bar the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to stop our recordings. Thank you guys for tuning in.